Good afternoon, responsive audience. Welcome. Welcome to Schollmeyer Auditorium in Ballwalker Hall at the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design on the campus of the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, it's my privilege today to welcome everyone here and everyone watching in the Young Gallery upstairs to welcome you to an exceptional set of events over the next two days, which hopefully will lead to even more exceptional events for the school in our expanded presence on the south side of Fayetteville on Martin Luther King Boulevard and Government Avenue in the Wingate Art and Design District. We uh, gather this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon to uh, hear presentations, three today and three tomorrow, for uh, proposals for what will be called the Anthony Timberlands Center for Design and Materials Innovation. This is a project that has emerged over the last three years, and we benefit uh, in the uh, encouragement of this effort from our chancellor, uh, Chancellor Steinmetz, our provost, Provost Coleman, from university facilities led by Mike Johnson, and in particular by uh, donors to the school, John Ed and Isabel Anthony and Anthony Timberlands, which is a venerable, honorable, and highly respected Timberlands company operating in South Arkansas. The uh, ambition for this, we could say, began uh, perhaps three and a half years ago when here in this school we hosted a symposium uh, regarding the emergence of new or somewhat new engineered timber and wood products in design and construction. And at the same time, we organized and hosted a seminar in Little Rock that was, in fact, uh, uh, keynoted by Governor Hutchinson and uh, keynoted further by Congressman Westerman, looking at the possibility of Arkansas being a center for mass timber design and construction and certainly for mass timber production. Now, three and a half years later, what has come to pass through a very dedicated set of efforts by faculty here in this school, students here in this school, staff in this school, has emerged over another set of conferences and seminars, another set of research-funded efforts, uh, and uh, ultimately then the gift to the school by the Anthonys. What we are seeing is the emergence, truly, of Arkansas as a leader in this field. We uh, had heard, of course, I think many have heard that as of December 9th in 2019, just a month and a half ago, in Conway, Arkansas, Structure Lamb, Canadian-based manufacturer of mass timber products, announced that it would be converting an existing 300,000 square foot uh, factory building to a mass timber production plant uh, in the state of Arkansas. That too keynoted, that announcement keynoted by Governor Hutchinson and Congressman Westerman, uh, but a significant investor in that effort is Walmart. And uh, you perhaps have also then followed the trajectory of Walmart as it has moved towards the announcement of its own corporate campus in Bentonville, some three million structured square feet under roof, uh, and their clear intention to construct that new headquarters out of mass timber, but specifically out of mass timber sourced from the Arkansas forests. In this school, we have looked ahead now, been able to look ahead now to our own building. And I will say as dean, I did not arrive here in 2014 with any intention or necessity of leading the school towards another building. We are the beneficiaries of a superb facility right here and now, which has recently received an AIA Honor Award and whose architect is, as you know, the AIA Gold Medalist this year. But in fact, we do need room for expansion, certainly in our workshops, certainly in 
with regard to uh, growth in, of enrollment, growth of graduate programs, growth of undergraduate programs, growth of faculty, uh, growth of ambitions. And I think those of you who work in our model shops and who work in the existing facility on Government Avenue can understand that there is a real need, not just an ambition, but a real need to improve our facilities and continue to expand our resources. And here too, the building under consideration now is of now vital importance to the interests of our school community, to the agendas of the university as a public land grant university, always seeking to be of impact and benefit to the citizens of this state, and certainly seeking now to be a leader regionally and nationally and potentially internationally in areas of importance. All this to say is that we're very pleased to look ahead together to the, this future uh, because there are many, many people who have brought us to this point. This afternoon, we're going to hear in succession uh, at 2 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, and at 6 o'clock from three of the six finalists for uh, the design competition, conceptual proposals, that have been submitted for the proposed building uh, in South Fayetteville. We'll hear, as the slide indicates, first from WT, T, sorry, WTGO Architecture of New Haven and London, then from Dorte Mandrup of Copenhagen, Denmark, and lastly, Grafton Architects of Dublin, Ireland. Before I say a few words about WTGO, I want to acknowledge the efforts of our uh, Anthony Timberland Center Project Committee. It is a 10-person committee uh, that I lead, but we work closely together. John Folan, Head and Professor of Architecture. Gabrielle Diaz Montemayor, Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture. Angela Carpenter, who is our Fabrication Workshop Supervisor. Carl Matthews, head and professor of interior design, John Balkins, teaching assistant professor and ultimately the owner representative into the project. Uh, uh, Jerry Snyder, who is the executive director of the School of Art, our neighbors on this site. And then three good members of university facilities, uh, Todd Ferguson, who's a senior campus planner, also an alumnus of the school. Uh, Jay Honeycutt, also campus planner, uh, uh, also an alumnus of our landscape architecture program, and Daniel Claremont, who oversees construction management. Together we have perhaps the unenviable, maybe enviable task of assessing our six finalists and proposing uh, a recommendation for the university's board of trustees to consider in March. But in this process, everyone's voice matters, and we will be seeking you, students, faculty, and staff will be seeking your opinions, your impressions as we go forward in this process. I uh, also want to acknowledge the um, amazing efforts of the school's exhibition team, uh, led by uh, Charles Sharpless and Justin Tucker, uh, but assisted by many, including Angie Carpenter, Randall Dickinson, and many, many students who have uh, uh, really labored mightily to bring the exhibition in the Smith Gallery into being. If you have not yet uh, been in the gallery to see those six entries on display, I recommend it. It is open now and will be open until the middle of March. We wrote a competition brief back in, we wrote an RFP actually in mid-fall uh, and sent that RFP out seeking uh, participants uh, in this design and construction effort, we received 69 submissions, which by most reports is four times as many as usually arrive for a university project, twice as many uh, as ever arrived for any university project. Clearly, we have a, a wild animal of a project that has proven to be extremely attractive to many from across the world. From those 69, we selected six finalist architecture firms for the design competition to envision the future Anthony Timberland Center for Design and Materials Innovation. 
The center is planned as an important extension of our school and as a key part of the emerging Wingate Art and Design District for the university, a new district along MLK that also houses existing and proposed buildings for the School of Art and the university libraries. The new Applied Research Center will serve as the epicenter for the Faye Jones School's multiple timber and wood design initiatives, housing the school's existing and expanding design build programs and fabrication technologies laboratories, and serve as the new home to the school's emerging graduate program in timber and wood design. And in this regard, I want to thank Professor Tahar Masadi for his leadership in developing our integrated wood design curriculum which we will be launching and announcing more publicly as the spring moves forward. The six finalists, again culled from 69 submissions from 10 countries, were selected based on the design excellence of the individual architect or practice at the national and even international level, as well as demonstrated achievements in innovation with materials and construction. All six finalists are accomplished in both professional practice and architecture education. And this is important because it is important, I think, for all of us on the faculty that this building project in process be educational as much as the outcome itself be a center for education. So you will hear from our finalists their regard for architecture education and their proposal as to how this project can, in fact, animate our efforts here at the school. Having said all that, you'll learn more about the specifics of the program as we go along, but you could certainly imagine that a fabrication laboratory of some size, between 10,000 and 20,000 square feet, is at the center of this building program. We will benefit, ultimately, as this building is constructed, not only from the generosity of the Anthony family and a matching gift by virtue of our chancellor, from the university funds, but also from uh, funds provided by Governor Hutchinson. At this point, $1 million is being provided to us to equip that fabrication laboratory. And you can believe that Angela Carpenter, Justin Tucker, and Randall Dickinson have a pretty good shopping list for what to do with that. So without further ado, I'd like to provide an overview of WTGO and then ask them to come and give their presentation to us. We uh, envision that there will be questions and we certainly want to invite those uh, from the audience. We have microphones available uh, to make those questions a bit more audible. Um, but uh, for the moment, let me provide a few introductory words for WTGO. WTGO architecture is a collaborative practice between London-based Waugh Thistleton Architects and New Haven, Connecticut-based Gray Organsky Architecture. The work of WTR, WTGO Architecture is rooted in material research and technical investigation through experimentation and analysis in practice and the university studio in seeking systematic solutions in construction that can reduce ecological impact the partners of WTGO Architecture have become global leaders in the design of mass timber buildings and structures at a wide array of scales and programs. WTGO Architecture has an extensive history in, of developing and designing timber technologies that serve as both structural and envelope systems that can be seen in their impressive body of work. Selected works include the Murray Grove Tower in London, England, 2009, the Mill River Park Carousel Pavilion in Stamford, Connecticut, 2017, the Vizzo Building in Royal Leamington Spa, England, 2015, founding principals Elizabeth Gray, Anthony Thistleton, Alan Organsky, and Andrew Waugh are highly respected in practice and academia. Collectively, they have been awarded, among many uh, accomplishments, the Arts and, sorry, Arts and Letters Award in Architecture by the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the RIBA President's Award. I'll ask uh, the members of the WTGO team who are here today to come forward, introduce themselves, and take us through their project. Welcome to you all.
Hello, everyone. Yeah, that, that wasn't very well choreographed. Is this working? Yes. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I am Lisa Gray, Elizabeth Gray, um, and uh, a member of WTGO Architecture. And I'm joined by colleagues Alan Organsky, uh, Andrew Waugh, and Tanya Luthi of Intuitive. Tanya is our structural uh, timber uh, uh, engineer and an expert in uh, timber engineering. And um, just before we launch into a little bit about our practice um, and our approach um, and the project that we're proposing, um, I just wanted to say how very much we've all enjoyed being part of this process um, for the last two months. So it's been a it's been a bit of a, um, a sprint over the two months to develop a, 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 what we think is a, um, f a quite developed concept of design um, that we are all very excited about. But more than just the design, which we're excited to share with you, we so respect um, the goals of this project and, we, and the uh, values of our own practice um, really align with what we understand as the purpose of this project, which is, um, to construct a building, um, design a process, and design a place that is a center of innovation for students to learn um, and develop for a low to zero carbon future. Um, and that's you architecture students. And so we really relish the process of, of having gotten to this point and the interactions that we've had and we endorse entirely um, the project. So uh, this is a sort of a view of our roof um, and I'll quickly, uh, take you through. So our practices in London and New Haven are founded in the practice of architecture uh, in a very serious uh, set of research investigations into the capacities of mass timber and timber generally to offset carbon and lead us in, our, in the construction industry to a low carbon future. Um, and then, and then the, uh, essential component of teaching and sort of outreach in the schools and, and the information that we get back from our students. So it's a, it's a kind of interactive set of um, approaches that feeds all of our work. Um, and here are just some uh, projects that we've done, the Mill River Carousel that I just showed you, some um, early bridge experiments that we undertook with Blue Lamb, um, and all of our practices, I think as Peter mentioned, um, are rooted very much in construction. We do construction management. And so we are most interested in the way in which uh, architecture is um, expressed as a built form. Um, so those um, uh, pressures are what uh, make the buildings work, in our opinion. So another small uh, experiment with cross-laminated timber of adding uh, a series of rooms on top of a unreinforced um, 19th century masonry building, so the capacity of CLT in this case to add living space to the 19th century, 20th century city um, through the addition of, uh, of kind of rooftop um, uh, additions, prefabricated, dropped in quickly, um, and also hopefully expressive in their experience. Um, part of our practice is residential. Um, we started that way, as I think many architects do, uh, and we still enjoy that side of our practice in addition to our institutional work. And we find that the um, experimental um, work that we can do in the, on the residential side feeds also our institutional work as well as the kind of concerns of scale and materiality and experience and, and light um, and space uh, that are, are at play in our residential work, which brings us, um, which we then deploy at larger scale in our institutional work. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, as Lisa was saying, the, you know, we've known each other as practices for oh, uh, 10 years now. And so much of the, the, the direction, the fascination of both practices has been so similar in the sense that we are both practices that uh, practice research and that our research is our practice, if you like. So we're constantly interested in innovation, in construction innovation, in design innovation, and how that affects and informs the architecture that we revel in. So this, for us, is a... This is our first brush with Arkansas, and uh, this is um, some, uh, a project that we did for the National Hardwood Lumber Association using tulip wood. And tulip wood, we were asked to do something in a beautiful American hardwood, and we said that we would prefer to do something, thank you, prefer to do something um, in, 
a more kind of low grade timber and to see what we could do from that. So we built, um, we made CLT ourselves um, in Scotland and we put together these kind of series of boxes here and you can see this one, these are laid out in the Victoria and Albert Museum in central London and following that we took them to Italy, for the, to Milan, to the Saloni and they're now in Madrid uh, for the design fair, they'll go to Venice for the Biennale in May and to Glasgow in November for the climate change conference. All of, in every time, in a different iteration and the boxes fit together differently. And so far we've had um, over half a million visitors seeing those boxes, seeing how beautiful, how practicable, how interchangeable uh, and how strong timber buildings can be. Uh, here is a shot of a, um, a storage barn that we did uh, in New England uh, and uh, just an example really of finding joy and potential in the um, kind of simple expression of a, of a barn clad in polygal um, where the, the materials that are, are uh, stored on the barn for this landscape contractor actually become the kind of finished surface and of course as the materials change the building changes and so we were really kind of reveling in that interaction between ma material and work. Um, so this is a, a barn for a loader and the loader loads the building and the loader makes use of the materials that are on the building for the projects that are being done so it's a kind of very dynamic cycle um, w using a very simple um, set of off-the-shelf materials. And actually brilliantly segueing into a building made of shelves, into a building to make shelves, uh, which this one is. So this is uh, for Vitsu, um, who are a shelving manufacturer in the Midlands in the UK. Um, and the brief behind this building was to make a building that was as adaptable and as um, flexible as the shelving system for which they, uh, for which they house, for which the building will house. So as you can see, I'm not very good at sitting down. So, I'm just gonna so as you can see, this beam here, this can slot into the columns. These little slots here take the beams. And so you can build, enlarge, extend, take down the building as it goes along. So this is done by the people that work in the factory. And as you can see, really kind of quite kind of sort of semi-temporary, semi-permanent kind of installations within the building uh, here. Also, we've used a hardwood um, laminated veneer lumber there as well, so um, to give us incredible strength for the frame of the building. And a stabilized earth floor here. <coughs> so you can see now, so this is all top lit, naturally uh, lit uh, manufacturing environment. And then at the end here we have a ballet school. So this, is, uh, this is about 450 feet long as a building. And the technical tolerance of the building over 450 feet was a quarter of an inch. So it's an incredibly precise, very kind of neat building. Uh, here's a project uh, in Connecticut that we did for an environmental charter school, a high school, um, with uh, ecology as at the basis of its pedagogy. Um, and it's a new, it's a new building um, for science and art. Um, and uh, it's cross-laminated timber largely, black spruce um, from the forests of Quebec. Um, and the interesting thing about this project in addition I, th I you know I hope to the way that it functions um, for the um, students at the school was the way in which the students and the faculty and the entire institution were uh, completely worked into the design and construction process so this was an example of kind of teaching through the design and construction of a building for high school students who were not archi architecture students but as we as we think as we envision the Anthony Timberland Center and what has already begun, uh, thanks to this competition that, that you are running, um, is this in, uh, amazing opportunity to engage you um, and the larger community here at the University of Arkansas in considerations of what it means to build a low carbon building, what it means to build a high performance building, where the materials are coming from, how it functions post-occupancy and how we can measure that, how we can express those measurements. Um, and we feel as though, though this was a, a group of ecology students who were not necessarily going to go into the design professions, that um, we, were, we were most excited about their engagement with this entire process and then their sort of proselytizing about this out in the larger world. Uh, and here's a very small project that we did for the United Nations 
um, about a year and a half ago, um, we were asked to design and build, deliver to the UN Plaza um, a, a small um, housing unit that would express as many of the United Nations uh, principles of sustainability um, as possible. And so uh, it's a cross laminated timber um, box that we, we fabricated at our shop in New Haven, um, rigged, shipped to New York, and installed on the UN Plaza without a crane, where we can't, we, not, one is not allowed, um, in three days. So it was a whole, it was the design of a, of, a, of a rigging and installation system as well as a piece of architecture. So it performs um, by a number of metrics that we then tracked with the Yale Center for Ecology and Architecture um, very closely. And this is a, a building of a different scale. This is about uh, 480,000 square feet and 41 stories. And it's an existing concrete frame tower building that we are extending in timber, both vertically and horizontally. And when we were um, working through the brief of this project with our client, we s had suggested that rather than comply to the series of checklists, that LEED or BRIAM or some kind of similar certification system might give, that actually our, um, our view of a kind of future of architecture should be aspirational, not one driven by ticking off uh, certain criteria. So um, in the same way that Lisa was describing on the previous project, what we did was to lay out the 17 goals, uh, the 17 sustainability goals of the United Nations and to track our project and the ambitions of our project along those sustainability goals. So they can be a, that's a much more diverse spread of ambition, which is about a regenerative architecture and an architecture for our future. Yeah, we're now moving up to this very large urban scale. And, and it gets to this idea that the work that we're all doing, you're engaged in doing in the studio, but that the school is engaged in thinking about the Anthony Timberland Center and that we try to engage in our practice goes from the, the molecular really to certainly the building scale, the urban scale, the territorial scales. And perhaps what we might suggest is that beyond that, there are different ways of, sorry about that, there, there are different ways of understanding the relationships of all those scales, the molecular function in the carbon cycle, how it, uh, how it uh, functions within a forest stand as it regrows, how uh, material harvested sustainably from those forest stands might be processed through a range of different uh, building products, harvested wood products, and applied to different spatial morphologies of human settlement. And, and that actually the efficiencies of building cities, and in particular building cities out of these biogenic material systems which store carbon, and which then allow the buildings, these large buildings to become some storage vaults for atmospheric carbon, is something that we try to track through our building. And so this becomes part of our research and then we project that out into a global scenario as working with industrial ecologists, forest scientists, material scientists, uh, life cycle assessment scientists to really try to understand the implications of those small moves we make, maybe in the shop scale, what it might mean when we bring it out um, and, and implement it across the world. And so as with the uh, production of a tulip wood cross laminated timber panel, it is a teaching opportunity. Uh, it's part of our educational uh, uh, mission, we feel, uh, whether it's educating students uh, in universities or workers who are being trained for whole new technologies that will give them livelihoods. Um, we certainly have a lot of experience with design build, which is, I know, close to the heart of, of, of the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. Uh, and in, with, at the Yale Building Project, I've, which I've been running for a couple of decades, uh, we've been able to actually teach students how to work fast and effectively to produce housing, not just for the people who normally are enfranchised with good housing stock, but also homeless communities in cities like New Haven. Or outreach, um, which is a big part of what we feel like our work is because we are at a critical moment of climate action. Right now, today, all of us have the chance to tell a story which few people really truly understand the capacity of forests and cities to work in synergies rather than as an antagonistic relationship. And we want our students to know that they can be involved not only with designing buildings and working in firms, but potentially creating policy. This is a meeting, summit meeting that we had with Secretary Vilsack, the Department of Agriculture, 
um, who came from Washington to learn about mass timber systems and how they might be applied to sit, uh, cities, and our students talked directly to him for hours about policy development and left knowing that they could play a role that was larger than just the single design project. And then finally, where does teaching really end for us as architects? We are engaged in creating vast areas of human settlement in the built environment, and we have a responsibility to educate every age group beyond the university students, beyond the workers who might be interested in new, new jobs, uh, new, whole new sectors of communities that need job training, skills training uh, that we want to try to engage. So we, we speak about what inspires our work and obviously the technology and the science inspires our work, but also places and the ecosystem surfaces that we tr so try so hard to engage. So it's, it's really uh, inspirational for us to look at a landscape like the Ozarks and to think about the watersheds that, that flow through it, that have shaped this land, that have created the forest soils that allow for such robust forests to grow. Um, and also this other incredible natural resource of, a sta of the state of Arkansas, which is a workforce spread across cities and also uh, rural landscapes, which need support from us. They need to be part of the supply chain that we draw upon, uh, and so we want to support those kinds of growths. And those are the supply chains themselves. How do they work? How do they work sustainably rather than um, extractively? How do we maintain those, those things? And uh, we find inspiration um, in looking at the buildings of the place. And as we have been contemplating the building for this place, um, we, we became um, completely obsessed with this series of um, mill and factory buildings that we f have found in the rural, in rural southeast. Um, and looking at them really not so much, or not only for their formal excitement, which is kind of undeniable, but really to understand how those forms are related to the functions of the buildings. That these are work buildings, they're work sheds, they have a, a, a basic um, functionalism and utility to them that, that uh, uh, forms them. Um, and we took inspiration from that too as we, as we made our proposal for the Anthony Timberland Center. And thinking about um, simple things like how those buildings were detailed, how they shed water, how they um, uh, allow airflow and ventilation, um, and how they maintain durability um, over their long lives. So now to, we'll explain our design proposal. Thank you. <coughs> So when we're looking at the design of this, looking at the site, understanding the context of our site, um, looking at uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard here to the north of the site, uh, Government Avenue to the east, the deliveries to the south, and up to the arts courtyard here to the west. So looking at how the architecture of this building is informed by its immediate context, um, that we uh, orientate this building from the where the deliveries come in here, that the gantry orientates and opens the building, that this becomes its permeability. So that we have two axes here that both that work with each other and then bring those axes up to form these series of ridges which are based on spans and, uh, and the structural capability of the material we intend to use. And then we take those ridges here and then open them up. So we're opening them up here to Government Avenue to bring it light into the building and to be able to, to get some kind of visual permeability into the building itself in plan. We then extend into the courtyard here so we're able to push those buildings out over their, kind of over their ground plan here to extend into there. And we then bring those roof ridges up to meet the adjacent context and to suit the brief, so the, br the, the, uh, the ridges here adjacent with this building to the uh, west and the ridges here to this building to the south. And then bringing this ridge point up here so that it forms that kind of uh, important urban corner, if you like, that addresses, uh, addresses the street. So you can see there the building from where we are over here to the building in context here, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Boulevard here and the rest of the arts buildings surrounding it. 
So this is the cultural arts corridor, which will link that building to Fayetteville. And then looking at the context of the site itself, so it's quite a fall here from, uh, from west to east, um, bringing the trucks in that will deliver the, deliver the materials into the school. So we have nine feet here, higher in this corner than this corner. We have a delivery uh, kind of loading height of this truck of four feet. So it's about bringing people in through the high point and bringing materials in through the low point. So able to raise that floor up there to meet the delivery here. And then when the people come through, they have that visual permeability all the way through the building. And the gantry here on big timber beams, the floating gantry here that can bring the materials from the delivery point into the public area. Then with the auditorium here and the auditorium lifting up to provide a kind of open space on that corner there, which we'll come on to. And then <coughs> the idea that actually uh, we have a screen here which can be raised and lowered to allow, uh, to allow goods into here. So you can see as this is picked up, delivered, take through the gantry, the screen goes up, and then it can become part of that kind of lecture series. So that this area on the corner becomes the confluence both of the learning here and of the doing here. The, uh, the, the organization of the building is really designed around the, the use of industrial components. Uh, it, it's a tough building. It has to withstand some, some wax from materials swinging through the air, the occasionally uh, poorly driven forklift. Uh, and, and, and so w the idea is that the structure, this, this kind of wonderful material that we can, we can use, wood, timber, in, in all its various forms, from cellulose, the fiber strands up to uh, large laminations of huge panels trucked in on, on, on large bed trucks creates the sort of language, architectural language of the, of the uh, building. And so what we're, we're doing essentially is creating a ground floor, which is, which is I'm looking for my pointer. I'm not going to worry about my pointer. I'll, I'll stand. It's a... It's okay, I'll just point. I'm really good at that. So the, uh, uh, although my mother told me not to, I do. Um, so the idea is that the central gantry runs at the core, creates a kind of high base space atrium with a lot of clearance for, for large building projects. Um, to the east along Government Ave are more segregated shop spaces uh, that lead finally to the most celebratory uh, uh, element in the in the catalog of really cool tools that's, that are going to be brought into the school, the robot, which needs to be protected because of its reach and swing, as with many of the kinds of tools that will be in those closed shops. But they'll be visual, vis visible to both the people in the work, high base space, but also on the street. And so we're celebrating work uh, as, a, as an urban strategy. Um, and then, of course, as Andrew's mentioned, uh, an upper kind of confluence, a public forum where we can discuss the work being made. Um, and note that there are four timber cores that, that provide the kind of table legs of the building. And so that's that primary axis which is so important. On the upper levels, we created these kind of open loft spaces which overlook that central atrium bay, which contain the studios um, and uh, also labs which are adjacent to them. These are sing single scenarios for how these buildings might might work, um, but they're intended to be open, adaptable, and flexible because you will be designing the institution and its curriculum and how it functions um, over the lifetime of the building and changing it. Um, on the third level, we have more labs, uh, potentially office spaces, both closed and open for faculty, and meeting spaces for faculty and student. And then up in the upper northwestern corner, you see the, uh, the uh, faculty, guest faculty apartment. And so that's a kind of open office uh, which is flexible. We, we imagine that uh, not only can, can we uh, allow students to work around the building on their own projects, but that the, an, a closed office space might actually become a pedagogical device where students would do a design build project, close the office, uh, do some uh, air testing, different material assembly techniques, so that always you're demonstrating each year new experiments in the building um, about building. 
And then on the upper level, of course, uh, the, this is a sort of area where historically libraries were up in lofts to protect them from moisture. And so we placed the library as, along with a material, experimental material archive on the upper floor um, and a large conference room that opens directly out into the, uh, a, a large rooftop terrace which overlooks the arts district courtyard and also to the south and east to the Ozarks. And here's just an example of a really simple idea of the flexibility of these, these loft spaces. This, these are the studios under the, underneath the gables, the folding pleated gables of the roof. Um, could be a big open studio, could be closed into smaller classrooms, uh, and that would become part of the, both the design of the building but uh, the, the process of the educational development. And so the building is trying, as Andrew pointed out, to, to really use its pleading of the roof to create several things. One is to, to bring the building into the sort of adjacent context, the context of this rather industrial commercial area along Martin Luther King Boulevard, um, but also the context of a university courtyard, a rather classic university block, uh, and to try to think about those relationships. And so the court really is an expression of the way the building performs, and we'll talk about that a little more. But essentially, those big valleys that we've created are like the, the watersheds of the Ozarks or any mountain range, and they shed water down into uh, constructed wetlands and gardens that become the, the, the sort of green spaces that reduce uh, heat island effect, that filter storm water, and they become a marker of the relationship between work and the natural environment. And then beyond, and of course we don't have uh, control of this in our design, but we're, we're proposing that the main courtyard becomes a kind of stepped arboretum. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a space where there are, um, there are constructed wetlands to take all the stormwater off these buildings and process it slowly, um, and there are stepped seating areas which serve as sort of amphitheaters for the activities, maybe a film projected onto the library annex, um, and then they, they de uh, evolve into more uh, kind of ordered bosques, but these are trees that are specimens of, of, of Arkansas's forests. And so the idea that while you're working on these great experiments, you're also looking out into the landscape at the very sources of the material um, that you've talked about. So just to very quickly run through the program, ground floor entry uh, from the northwest, which allows connectivity to the future graphic design building, a uh, kind of muse that connects Martin Luther King into this wonderful wor world of the workyard. Uh, the exhibition space with reception, uh, a large auditorium under which you see the robot doing its work, um, an apron for landing materials from this long gantry bay, 44 feet wide, so quite a bit of capacity, and then uh, closed shops, as I said, open work bays that flood out onto this courtyard space, which are shaded by uh, Arkansas's trees in the hot summer days. On the upper level, very quickly, loft space for studios and labs, working together, so adjacencies are really important in this building, printer plotter farm, cl closed classroom and seminar room, and then this double height sort of attic space of the auditorium. Upper level, more labs, breakout spaces, fac guest faculty apartment, and then office spaces of different types for different uh, uh, faculty preferences. And then finally, the roofscape, which produces at its northern end a bulk that makes this a truly urban building, material, access, uh, material archive, library with a beacon to the northeast, and then conference room and this event space on the roof. So the elevations, we've been pretty stingy with glazing for a couple of reasons. Glass has enormous embodied carbon. The uh, impact of sintering glass has significant environmental impact. It's difficult to manage, it's expensive. Um, and so what we've really tried to do is key the relationship between the skylights on the roof, which we'll talk about a little bit, and the way in which we get views that are controlled by a, a, a sheath of, of louvers made of, of ash and the ash wood has been thermally modified to guarantee its durability on the surface of the building. Um, and so really, windows are designed for workspaces to have specific views, to balance the skylight, to, to reduce glare, and also to kind of create, create a celebration along the street level. That went fast. Um, 
along the street level so that people who are passers, passers by can enjoy the incredible machinery of work going on in those spaces. And so the section really is, is the performance of this space. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Skylights, roof terrace, high work bay with overlooks from studios and, and, and labs, and then the more sort of urban responsible side of, of the space, which includes exhibition, auditorium, uh, office classrooms, sorry, offices, and then uh, the attic spaces of the building. And so there are many scenarios by which we can imagine the interiors of this building, but the interiors are one place that I think we would tend to let off a little bit and allow that to be part of a collaboration with the school to imagine how students might build furniture, might build partitions, might develop interior surfaces, um, the different characters that might take, uh, of, of different occup occupancies that might take place in a studio. Um, and then the street elevation, which uh, relies on two, three very sort of significant moments, obviously a carved out entry, uh, a, a lit louvered window surface, a sort of hiked up uh, edge uh, contour, which allows views into the robot, and then finally this lantern space. And the section which celebrates uh, a sort of roof ceiling datum that becomes the acoustical surface of the building. And then finally, the critical section, which Andrew started talking about right at, right at the beginning, which is that actually as uh, the street to the south praxis rises, we, we can level out the work yard with the rising roadway, uh, but you can see the relationships that are fundamental sectionally to the function and also the experience of the school. And a bit about the performance, because the building is designed to perform environmentally. The folds on the roof, as I mentioned, serve as watersheds, which then uh, have a, a downspout relationship to, to uh, catchment areas, so, so rain gardens and constructed wetlands. The south-facing slopes of this folded roof create surfaces for photovoltaic power generation. Uh, daylighting on the northern slopes through polycarbonate skylights, which we've used uh, extensively. They're sort of stock items, and we try to use off-the-shelf parts where we can. Um, the building systems are fully integrated through the structural system, and that's a big part of prefabrication in timber architecture, which is you use your sophisticated modeling equipment to coordinate and reduce collisions of mechanical systems with structure. Um, and it's one of the beauties of, of building a building information model and engineering through prefabrication techniques a timber uh, uh, system, structural system. And so when you compose all of those passive systems, uh, which include also stack ventilation in those tall spaces through uh, vented skylights, you, you basically are gaming the seasons of the year. So the shoulder seasons, you try to activate the most passive systems as much as possible to reduce energy. Um, while using, uh, adding the natural uplift effect of heated air through the vented skylights, uh, you su uh, su support that with high volume, low speed fans. Um, and we use outdoor conditions monitoring so that we can switch over effectively between uh, the, the shoulder season kinds of temperate uh, periods of and the, the, the heating and cooling periods so that we're effective in, in distributing the energy loads. Um, the shop spaces we, we've conceived with our uh, mechanical engineer, Bernhardt, um, Stano Baum, uh, discussing the idea of trying to make that open base space a, a passively, uh, almost like a, a cooler space that feels like it's a little closer to outdoors, maybe not on a day like this, but, but definitely uh, uh, on those warm spring and fall days where the air is crisp and clear and it's nice to open up doors. I'm going to go through this, and these are just some shots of the model, which you can see in the gallery, but it gives you an, a sense of the sort of simplicity of the volumes and how the, how the roof systems work, uh, the, the facade elevations uh, that, that combine open apertures with, with louvered apertures, um, just some different views, which I'll move through pretty quickly. And then the kind of character of those open spaces. Um, we build a lot of models uh, to test, but also to, to uh, sort of describe and visualize uh, our ideas, and then the basic plan diagram, which you can see fairly clearly. So uh, one of the things that we is a big part of our practice is uh, fabrication, as Andrew mentioned, and so we work hard to 
organize our buildings in such a way that we can organize our design process in such a way that we can actually study at large scale building models to test the feel of them because there's nothing better than projecting yourself into the scale of a model. I'm going to turn this over to Tanya. You've been listening to me talk much too much, but I'll, I'll just say within these systems, we're, we're trying to make a building which relies on the flows of material out of the forests and out of the landscapes of, of uh, Arkansas. Yeah, so just to touch briefly on uh, the structural concepts here, um, I think we, we came at this um, from the very beginning with very much a desire to keep the structure simple um, and to bring kind of a discipline and a rigor to the structure, um, being mindful of the realities of the construction budget. Um, and so, uh, you know, really where possible, trying to keep the spans reasonable, you know, keep, keep the structure kind of efficient and economical. And then carefully choosing those moments where you really want the structure to do something a little bit more for you in service of something that's important architecturally. So um, that kind of northeast corner of the building that we've referred to as kind of the beacon, right? That's the area where you have um, the auditorium space as well as that corner at the ground level where you have the robot. And um, as Alan mentioned, you know, we've purposely been a little bit stingy with the glazing. So the places where you have that glazing, you really want to be able to show it off. So keeping that corner open um, at the ground level so that people can really see in and kind of see through that corner. Um, some cantilevers out on the west side, again, to create that this kind of covered um, workspace and kind of um, blurring that line between inside and outside and letting the, um, the work happen kind of in both of those places. Um, so being choosy about those moments, essentially, and everywhere else, just really trying to keep the structure simple and quiet. Um, but that said, uh, you know, just because it's simple doesn't mean it needs to be dumb. Uh, and I think that's one of the beauties of timber is that uh, with this one material, there's so many um, kind of options for us to explore. And I think that um, has, is particularly true for this building, just given the program and the typology, but also where this building is, you know, in the state of Arkansas and looking at, um, you know, we've really only in, in the last two months started to barely scratch the surface of what the opportunities are um, for us as we think about what this structure can be. Um, and that is sort of various different kinds of spectra. So from the, you know, the small to the large or from the kind of solid sawn to the more um, manufactured sort of glued products to doweled products, um, existing technologies versus kind of newer technologies um, and thinking about ways that we can, um, you know, leverage the manufacturers that are here in Arkansas and maybe use them to, you know, maybe we should look at, you know, hardwood LVLs that are manufactured locally and sort of ta borrowing technology that we know exists in other places and seeing if we can bring them here and integrate them um, into this project and use the different products in ways that sort of make structural sense. Um, and that can also provide, you know, so to be honest, a sort of certain aesthetic level, a lot of this structure is going to be exposed um, and making sure that things are kind of beautiful, which is nice and easy with, with timber. Um, so as you can see, and not just the structure, but also, you know, thinking about how we can use um, wood fiber, you know, including the cladding and the envelope and insulation and all those kinds of things. So it's not just about structure, but thinking carefully about how we can really kind of use um, all the parts of the tree. Um, thinking about connections is always something that I spend a whole lot of time thinking about. It's um, you know, it's kind of the reverse of what you do, at least in my experience, when you, um, when you design in steel and concrete, you size members and you worry about connections later. Um, and with, with timber, it's almost the, sort of the flip. Um, you really want to be thinking about those connections first. Um, and that kind of really inform the whole design and making sure that things are nice and clean. Um, and just kind of a little bit of the, the diagram um, of the structure starting from the ground and working our way up. Um, so kind of these four trunks, if you will, these kind of very large and solid elements that are coming up at the four corners of the building. So a nice, very simple lateral system structurally in addition to providing the circulation um, that's needed here. So these would be um, most likely in CLT. Um, and then kind of these, uh, these piers that we have along the crane gantry. Um, again, sort of the lar larger elements, more solid elements. But, uh, and the crane gantry itself, sort of playing around with ideas of maybe this doesn't need to be a steel crane. Uh, maybe it can be hardwood LVL or some other kind of um, timber integrated into the gantry system. Um, and then kind of the, the bread and butter, if you will, just the kind of regular um, framing system. Again, trying to keep the spans reasonable here. 
uh, flooring system, and again, there's lots of options here. We've, we've kind of gravitated a little bit towards maybe a dowel laminated um, flooring system, uh, which could be manufactured fairly easily with locally sourced materials of all kinds, um, but there's other options here as well. Um, again, integrating um, timber into the enclosure, CLT panels um, in the enclosure on the screen. A layer of, of, of uh, cellulose insulation, so wood-based rigid insulation over the CLT, a vapor open wall assembly, and then layered with uh, thermally modified ash slats. Yeah. Um, the folds of the roof, again, um, trying to keep it very simple, and it's very straightforward, really, just glue lamp beams at the ridges and valleys and straight sticks in between, sort of rafters in between, so a very simple framing system. Um, that sort of ties into the, the columns, again, sort of opening up this corner by not dropping the columns straight down, but kind of using these sloped columns um, to sort of reveal that corner a bit. Timber soffit below these, and here are the rafters, right? Just again, just straight sticks, nothing, nothing fancy. Um, then with our sheathing and insulation and then the roofing system on top. Skylights. Po again, the polycarbonate skylights uh, that bring light down into that tall space. I think we'd be remiss in, in talking about resources and the relationship between uh, material sources and, and building activity by our sector, which is one of the largest consumers of, of energy and material. 50% uh, of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from us and what we design. Uh, so we have a big share of the responsibility. But just looking at the different landscapes that exist and the resources that come out of them, both sustainable uh, materials uh, coming out of uh, evergreen forests and, and broadleaf deciduous forests, uh, different kind of hard, hardwood forests that are underused in mass uh, timber right now. Uh, but thanks to Andrew's great work in tulip poplar, we're starting to see that change and with support from the National Hardwood Lumber Council. Uh, and then also just the geologies of, of uh, the soils that are available to us that, that allow us to use uh, uh, reinforced rammed earth slabs and limecrete, um, but, but also the residues of the very manufacturing that we use that allow us to engage the circular economy of materials, both the biological cycle, which we've talked a lot about today, but also the technical cycles that produce vast amounts of waste, mineral-based waste, plastics, uh, and certainly steel, which could all be part of the palette of this, this building to describe a, a more uh, forward-leaning uh, approach to building in the future. And then finally, how those processes lead into the building. Andrew's gonna make this. And just some, some views of the uh, experience of the building, which of course is very important. Um, and as, as Tanya mentioned, um, really, the structure is the finish of the building, um, and it is the experience, the material experience of the building, um, and we are aiming for uh, an inspirational workspace um, where students are engaged in uh, making things within this building and outside of it, sheltered by it, and they are also working on the building, um, as Alan mentioned, ideas about fitting out the building for different flexible, adaptable uses as the curriculum develops as, as, as um, faculty collaborate with students on um, finding appropriate uses for these spaces that can change. And this is a, an architecture which is a timber architecture. This isn't a steel building or a concrete building made of timber. This is an architecture that springs from an understanding and a love and a passion for timber construction. And you can see with these heavy kind of, this is the LVLs here taking the crane, all the way through the building here to MLK at the end, to the conference room at the top here, and out there into the arts courtyard. And the exterior of the building, uh, fairly quiet, um, utilitarian, uh, sh sheltered from sun, limiting glazing, um, but underneath the um, overhangs to the west, um, ordinary industrial um, garage door system that we've used quite a lot um, to create that kind of indoor-outdoor experience, which will be very useful um, to the making spaces um, in, in many, many seasons. And an understanding of the kind of west-facing solar glare, so protecting these windows as necessary from that glare here. And then you can see the open terrace 
the, the kind of party terrace on the top. The party terrace, the important party terrace, um, and uh, where, where you have this in, uh, capacity for these absolutely spectacular views out to your surrounding landscape, and also the ability to look down and see the work that's taking place in, in the fabrication spaces below. Um, you know, talking about a design uh, doesn't give uh, kind of, uh, it's important, what I should, let me start again. It's important in talking about the design that we refer to the teammates who have already been uh, worked with us on so far on this design. Uh, obviously, intuitive engineering. Uh, we have Tanya working closely with us on structural, but we also have intuitive working on fire safety engineering, environmental uh, modeling, and for the to, to, to look at for the energy effectiveness of the building, but also its envelope. Working with um, Stan Dobin um, at, at Bernhard and his team, looking at mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, its integration through a really careful modeling system that I mentioned earlier uh, that will make this building uh, actually easier to build, we believe. Um, our, and then, and then the, the, the team that is really on the ground in a sense, the people who really need to understand the horticulture, the climate, uh, the soils, uh, ground control, Will Belcher and his team from uh, Ground Control Landscape Architecture, and also uh, Robert and Jay and the folks at DCI who've been really helpful with uh, understanding really uh, not only the, the technical aspects of the site, but, but also the vision that the university plan has for the Wingate District, you know, and what we're trying to do is understand through this team uh, the, 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 the stringent uh, goals of the, of the alignments that exist on the master plan, which this building observes on Martin Luther King Boulevard on the east at government and also to the south, um, while um, trying to have an expression into the courtyard uh, to the west, as we said. And then it's important also to note that we can't cap this process off without a really strong teammate here in Arkansas's architect of record. And so we propose to work with our friends, um, Chris, Jason, and Josh, at, and their uh, incredible design firm, uh, Modus Studio. Um, but there is something more that we want to talk about, which is important to all of us, and that is that the team, as we envision it, is actually the university and its students. And so we see this having taught a number of us design, build, and project-based learning techniques for many now decades. Um, it's important that we understand this building as a potential project-based learning educational opportunity for the students across disciplines at the university. And, and so that's something that we would propose to engage in this as a teaching collaboration with the faculty here. Um, using the building as test cases and platforms for research, experimentation, publishing articles. Um, and, and so I think that calling, you know, just calling out these group folks who have been extremely instrumental in developing this design doesn't take into account the potential of the university to uh, drive the design forward through its incredible resources, which is, are its people. And so we'll end there uh, and ask for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, as with our other um, uh, Friday evening conversation, we want to invite questions at this point. I'm happy to run around with the microphone. Uh, and when you do uh, have a question, please, uh, stand and identify yourself, student, faculty, staff, alumnus, etc. Uh, and then uh, we'll hear from, we, it's about 3.10 now. We've got about 15, maybe 20 minutes for questions if, if we need them. So, may I invite questions? Is there one? Yes. Up there. Is that working? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much. That was a really wonderful presentation. So um, as educators, could you talk about like your experience doing, I know at least one is experienced in doing design build stuff with students. How did that inform the way that you design the space? Um, I, we've all 
all been involved in design build. Tanya and I have taught together actually at the Yale Building Project, which has been great, and, and Lisa and Andrew too. Um, but I, I'll, I'll take that question because I think it's really fundamental. Obviously, there are constraints in a schedule and a budget uh, uh, in the design of a building that has to meet certain kind of standards of the university facilities management process and procurement method. Um, but what we're looking for is to understand, uh, in a sense, design build first as the design component, which is we know that we're actually building something. And, and design build to me isn't just a hammer swinging exercise where you get to go out and get a suntan in the summer after working really hard in the studio. And it's not just a way of making bespoke one-off things that you put in your portfolio when you go out for your first job. And I say that because I think there's been a debasement in the discussion of what design build is uh, for students. Um, and I, I don't see that happening here and so I don't mean to attribute that in, in that way. But what I would say is that I think what has been best demonstrated in places like the University of Arkansas is that design build is a platform with super high stakes by which students with any specific interest they might have, issues of social out outreach, community development, ideas about the circular economy, life cycle assessment, uh, building finance, uh, material technology, anything that you might want to study becomes this very significant platform for that research. And that's the whole fundamental idea of project-based learning pedagogies. And I think that's what design build really is. So in the first stage, I would say we come, would come to Arkansas and essentially work really closely not just presenting our ideas, but using the feedback mechanisms that are provided by scenario investigations by students um, and faculty uh, as work modules or, or, or teaching modules that might exist around the making of the building, which will inevitably make you all the authors of this building. Um, and then there's the second phase, which is how do students maintain this once the building is done? Um, we're trying to leave the building as flexible and open as possible. We all love furniture and making and design and interior design, which you can probably see from our work. But we understand this to be, again, a kind of platform for uh, recursive research of making, thinking, learning through making. Uh, so it would be, uh, I think, a mistake for us to over-design the building and thereby create endless opportunities for making things that will move out into the rain and be studied there, uh, stay inside to study indoor air quality, any of the options that might, any, any possibilities that might be generated by working within the building as a resource. If I can just um, add uh, and take a slight step back, the charge of the competition and the charge to the finalists is to produce what I will still call conceptual design proposals, which is to say none of this is immediately and should never be thought of moving forward directly into uh, design development, construction documents at all. These are ideas for a building for us uh, in which, uh, yes, there's a degree of specificity that's been provided, but the moment that uh, we go forward into contract, we will be returning to the very important task of programming the building, which means uh, scenario planning, community engagement, uh, working with focus groups, uh, students, faculty, and staff in order to understand truly what this building will be. Yeah, and if I could just jump onto that, Peter. Um, I think we, we see the work that we're putting in front of you today as the very beginning of the conversation and, and our attempt to kind of visualize what we learned from the competition brief and what we've understood um, about the program here at the University of Arkansas and the goals for the building and the program. Um, so this is the, it's really the beginning of, I think, a series of collaborations with the faculty. It's very important to talk about that also. So the, the way in which this process, not only building but process, um, is designed as a teaching tool from this moment on. I, I mean, it really is already taking place because you've got this amazing um, set of uh, presentations and, and exhibition and uh, you know, you've, uh, you're all engaged in that so that, that the sort of energy and learning around just the launch of this is, is quite remarkable, I think. Um, but that, but we, we don't sit here saying we know exactly how this design build scenario uh, and how the learning platforms around that will play out. There are so many uh, divergent possibilities and directions that it can take. Uh, and we really look forward to a very lively collaboration with, with faculty and students in the design of the, those processes. The design, uh, the design and the construction. So, you know, over the kind of coming months and years, the idea that we can work 
alongside students and faculty to design the building, to um, produce the working drawings for that building, the uh, research around the materials and the manufacture, the construction of that building, the evaluation of its occupancy. So it's like an ongoing kind of like live research piece that then kind of, you know, has ultimately this amazing kind of like uh, book or reference material of the whole process of creating an architecture. Other, other questions, and again, just to remind you, it'd be great if you could identify yourself at the start of your question. It's here in the center, please. Hello. Cool. I can yell, but this is probably better. Um, so my name is Rachel. I'm a landscape architecture student, um, and I wanted to ask what kind of considerations you took to think about the way that the building flows with the landscape overall. I mean, I'm from FHS, so I know for a fact that, you know, this view out onto the, the hills is really beautiful and is a really important aspect of FHS. So how did you take that into account, the overall view from the different angles? F FHS meaning Fayetteville High School. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's really difficult when you're foreign but you speak the same language because you kind of don't always understand <laughs> what the initialisms mean. But um, yeah, I think that, you know the landscape of this place is so um, is so rich and feels so alive. I can tell you, coming from a country which is so kind of curated, actually, you know the difference in that, the kind of the celebration of that kind of of that of that kind of abundant greenery and abundant kind of growth that you find all around you. You know that the landscape will provide. Um, in the arts courtyard needs to have a flavor of that, you know, needs to take, as Alan was saying, the kind of, you know, the rain from the roofs, um, so you have sustainable drainage systems, but it uses the shade of the trees, and we're not talking about trees in tubs, you know, the idea is that we put forward really beautiful specimens of local trees, and that we use those as spaces where people can sit under and read and drink coffee and, you know, and, and look out at our beautiful building. <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate that question because in the rush of a presentation like this, uh, we tend not to say all the th many things that we thought about and talked about and debated about and argued about. Uh, and one of those things is really the relationship that which we feel is fundamental to this building, which is the relationship between that ground floor and that work yard and that work yard to another kind of landscape which is common to universities. And then another, another landscape which exists which is a, a very paved, impervious surface of parking lots and multi-lane roadways. Uh, and you know that automobile world is a debased environment. We've lost of megatons of of biomass and the potential for restorative soil systems. And so we're countering that very urbanized, very hard, impervious world to uh, what we hope is a restorative idea that building isn't just about covering over things. Building is about generating and catalyzing growth, both of human beings, but also ecosystems. And how that we use the ecosystem services that these landscapes provide to reduce the load our building puts on the environment. And so in some senses, the views to the Ozark are a proxy, or the Ozarks, or perhaps the view northward to uh, Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design are proxies for something about trying to engage a much larger system boundary of analysis, which has to include an interdisciplinary and transcalar relationship between many of the disciplines in the school and actually landscape design, interior design, furniture making, architecture are at the center of that. In fact, I think they're the hub. And so that's how I would respond to that. I, these views are proxies for a larger ambition about understanding a broader system boundary of design. Sorry, it took me ages to find that picture. <laughs> but this is what we were talking about. <laughs> Integrating the landscape within the kind of the views of the space of the place taking advantage of the shaded, cooler air to bring that through the building. We had a question in the back corner. I think the oldest senior student amongst us is, has a question. 
Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Shannon. Um, your firm obviously has a very strong conceptual approach. Uh, my guess is that it didn't spring full blown the minute you started your firm, that you were influenced by other firms and other architectures. Could you describe those influences? <laughs> you know what? Uh, how long? Yeah, how long have you got? The um, the funny thing is actually, Al and I worked in the same office um, about know, years ago, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which was for it was and yeah, 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 so, and we missed each other by months, yeah. right? So we all worked on the British Library for Colin St. John Wilson, and I think that there is, you know, there's there's a technology, a technological and a material kind of fascination from those from that kind of architecture that's yeah. that, that was really that's really important to both of our practices and I also think that there's a kind of that there's an ethos based architecture which which is essential to our practices and is I think really um, really unites us as a kind of like as a way of approaching yeah and a, and a, and a basis in, ma in making and when you think about Colin St. John Wilson um, and his devotion and, and deep knowledge of Alto um, it affected all of us, I think, very very profoundly, too. So there's too many yeah. people to list, probably, but that there's a kind of through line there about a humanist a humanist architecture and that's... Contextual. The contextual yeah. humanist architecture that's based in making, which we aspire to. Time for one more. Yes, down here. <laughs> Microphone coming. Hi. Here Hi. it comes. Hello, I'm Russell. I'm one of the architecture faculty here. Um, to Peter's point, uh, I just want you to briefly answer this question, and that is, what is the what is a primary idea about your proposal that you are the most excited about? I know. <laughs> I I know. Um, I know what it. It's you know what it is that we've been building wooden buildings for a long time between us four, and um, we built more than 35, we counted, um, mass timber buildings. We've been researching and thinking about the architecture of timber buildings and what, how that might play out, how that might develop into a kind of low carbon timber future. And for us in the UK, um, we've had to, we really have never been commissioned to do a timber building. Only Vitsu is the only time we've ever been commissioned to do a timber building. And all the rest of the buildings, we were commissioned to build affordable housing or commissioned to build you know, a cemetery or whatever it was. And then we've, we've done that in timber. And we've made an argument for timber based on cost and program, sometimes even on sustainability. But this building, this building is a building that celebrates timber, designed by architects and engineers that celebrate timber. Now that is a perfect confluence to me, and that's what makes the project so exciting. Does that answer your question? We may need to sure. leave it. We may need to leave it there at the moment of celebrating timber, uh, in order to move forward uh, to our, our two o'clock presentation. But in conclusion, and I'll hold you to that uh, last statement about uh, from your approach. Um, we're very grateful uh, to you, all of you, and there are many others I know who have contributed to what you've brought to us uh, last week and today, and please extend our appreciation to them. Um, we benefit here and now from everything you've just uh, described and enthused about and even instructed us on, and uh, we, we wish you well. Uh, that was perhaps the, the most diplomatic thing I can say at this point in this <laughs> process. Uh, and uh, 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 thank you very much again on behalf of the school and the university. So. Thank you. Thank you.